Okay, we're on chapter 7 in the False Arrest and Imprisonment Treatise by Charles A. Weissman. I'm just saying that for the recording in case anybody listens. Uh, page 51, and if you're using the PDF, uh, page 49 in the actual treatise. Okay, we're going to start reading. Uh, it says, Bringing arrested person before a magistrate, duty of officer. It is a fundamental rule of procedure, well grounded in the common law, that where an arrest is made, the alleged offender is to be taken before a magistrate to be dealt with according to law. This is not only to be done, but done without delay or without unnecessary delay. Otherwise, the arresting party is liable for a false imprisonment. In Blackstone's Commentaries, Volume 4, Chapter 21, page 292, it was stated that a constable may, without a warrant, arrest anyone for breach of the peace committed in his view and carry him before a justice of the peace. The officer must bring a person he has arrested directly to a magistrate, otherwise it is a breach of duty. Court case quote, it is the duty of an officer or other person making an arrest to take the prisoner before a magistrate with reasonable diligence and without unnecessary delay. And the rule is well settled that whether the arrest is made with or without a warrant, an action from false imprisonment may be predicated upon an unreasonable delay in taking the person arrested before a magistrate, regardless of the lawfulness of the arrest in the first instance. Close quote. Thus, even if the arrest was lawful, a failure to take the person arrested to a magistrate will be regarded as unlawful imprisonment as the Supreme Court of Minnesota held, quote, Even though an arrest be lawful, a detention of the prisoner for an unreasonable time without taking him before a committing magistrate will constitute false imprisonment, close quote. In an exhaustive decision on the common law rule of the process and procedure for arrests, the Supreme Court of Mississippi, in the case of Oric v. State, said, by the common law of England, an arrest without warrant for a felony can be made only for the purpose of bringing the offender before a civil magistrate, close quote. This procedure is the due process of law to be followed in depriving one of his liberty. Thus, a failure or even a delay in following this process is an unlawful restraint or deprivation of liberty and thus a type of false imprisonment. The arresting officer has no authority to take a person to a jail and detain him there. His duty is to take the one arrested without delay to a court or magistrate. As said by the Supreme Court of Kansas, your neck of the woods, Dave, quote, the law contemplates that an arrest either by an officer or a private person with or without a warrant is a step in a public prosecution and must be made with the view of taking the person before a magistrate or judicial tribunal for examination or trial. And an officer even subjects himself to liability if there is an unreasonable delay after arrest in presenting the person for examination or trial, close quote. <clears throat> Excuse me. The only reason that can justify having an arrested person in jail or detained by the arresting officer is as a necessary step in bringing him before a magistrate, as so stated by the Supreme Court of Rhode Island. Quote, when an officer makes an arrest without warrant, it is his duty to take the person arrested without unnecessary delay before a magistrate or other proper judicial officer having jurisdiction in order that he may be examined and held or dealt with as the case requires. But to detain the person arrested in custody for any purpose other than that of taking him before a magistrate is illegal, close quote. Thus, detainment in a jail for purposes of booking or fingerprinting or investigating the alleged crime or interrogation of the prisoner is illegal. 
In cases involving the commission of the most severe crimes, as in felonies, the one arresting is still required without unnecessary delay to bring the prisoner to the nearest magistrate or court as a matter of fundamental law. Court case quote, from the earliest dawn of the common law, a constable could arrest without warrant when he had reasonable grounds to suspect that a felony had been committed and he was authorized to detain the suspected party such a reasonable length of time as would enable him to carry the accused before a magistrate. And this is still the law of the land. Close quote. The court went on to state that the officer making the arrest is liable for false imprisonment if he arrests with the intent of only detaining or if his unreasonable delay causes a detainment. This is a citing from uh, One Hill Torts, pages 213 and 14, section 9. It cannot be questioned that when a person is arrested, either with or without a warrant, it becomes the duty of the officer or the individual making the arrest to convey the prisoner in a reasonable time and without unnecessary, unnecessary delay before a magistrate to be dealt with as the exigency of the case may require. The power to make the arrest does not include the power to unduly detain in custody, but on the contrary, it is coupled with a correlative duty incumbent on the officer to take the accused before a magistrate as soon as he reasonably can. If the officer fails to do this and unreasonably detains the accused in custody, he will be guilty of a false imprisonment, no matter how lawful the original arrest may have been. Close quote. Thus, where a person arrested is taken to a jail or sheriff's office and detained there with no warrant issued before or after the arrest, it is false imprisonment. The one arresting has a duty to immediately seek a magistrate and that the failure to do so makes a case of false imprisonment as a matter of law is held by all the authorities. In a case involving an indictment for assault and false imprisonment, the Supreme Court of North Carolina held that in the process of a lawful arrest, the one arrested is to be taken immediately to a judge. Court case quote, the question occurs, what is the officer to do with the offender when he shall have been arrested without warrant? All the authorities agree that he should be carried as soon as conveniently may be before some justice of the peace. Close quote. Though this case involved an arrest without warrant, the court said it is the duty of the arresting officer upon making an arrest, whether with a warrant or without one, to carry the offender at once before a justice. To take an arrested person to a jail to be detained and fingerprinted is a violation of his rights. It is proof the officer had no intent to bring the accused directly to a judge. In Anderson's treatise, treatise on the law of sheriffs, the subject of an officer's duty after arrest was examined with this conclusion. This is a quote. It is the undoubted right on the part of a prisoner on being arrested by a public officer or private citizen and unquestionably a corresponding duty on the part of the one making the arrest to take the prisoner before a court or magistrate for a hearing or examination. And this must be done without unnecessary delay. The object of this right and corresponding duty is that the prisoner may be examined, held, or dealt with as the law directs and the facts of the case require. It is highly improper and in invasion of the lawful rights of the prisoner to take him to any other place than to a proper court or magistrate, close quote. If anybody wants a copy of the PDF on Anderson's Treaty on the Law of Sheriffs, just let me know and I'll just email it to you. In deciding the proper duty and action of an arresting officer after making an arrest, the Supreme Court of Appeals for Virginia stated that the right of the accused to prompt judicial examination does not depend upon their statute law. That's kind of an oxymoron, statute law. <clears throat> Quote, 
But even if the circumstances of the arrest were not within the purview of this particular statute, it was the duty of the arresting officer to have taken a defendant within a reasonable time or without unnecessary delay before a judicial officer in order that the latter might inquire into the matter and determine whether a warrant should be issued for the detention of the defendant or whether he should be released. Close quote. And in speaking of what manner of arrests were lawful at common law and what are the procedures under common law when an arrest is made, the Supreme Court of Rhode Island held that, coupled with the authority to arrest went an imperative obligation on the officer to bring the arrested person before a magistrate without unreasonable delay. Especially was this true where the arrest was made without a warrant. When an officer makes an arrest without a warrant, it is his duty to take the person arrested without unnecessary delay before a magistrate or other proper judicial officer having jurisdiction in order that he may be examined and held or dealt with as the case requires. But to detain the person arrested in custody for any purpose other than that of taking him before a magistrate is illegal. Close quote. <clears throat> This rule of law requiring an officer or a person arresting to bring the party arrested before a magistrate is the same in all states and cannot be abrogated by statute. The same rule has been upheld in federal courts and is prescribed under Title 18 in the Rules of Criminal Procedure, quote, an officer making an arrest under a warrant issued upon a complaint or any person making an arrest without a warrant so take the arrested person without unnecessary delay before the nearest available federal magistrate, or in the event that a federal magistrate is not reasonably available before a state or local judicial officer authorized by 18 U.S.C. Section 3041, close quote. In a federal case where a man was arrested by two FBI agents assisted by two local policemen, on an outstanding warrant for bank robbery, the agents placed the man in a police vehicle, drove a few blocks, and then parked on the street under a street lamp. The officers interviewed the man concerning the crime, and within a few minutes he confessed to the crime. The Federal Court of Appeals said the confession was inadmissible and reversed his conviction, as the momentary parking of the police vehicle en route from the place of arrest was a detour from the path toward a prompt present, presentment before a magistrate. The court stated, quote, the law requires an arresting officer to bring in an accused before a magistrate as quickly as possible, close quote. The rights of the accused were violated as he was not promptly taken before a judicial officer as the law required, but instead was questioned while held in custody. It is said that the police are guilty of oppression and neglect of duty when they willfully detain a prisoner without arraigning him before a magistrate within a reasonable time. In a case where a person sued for being arrested without a warrant and confined in a jail without examination before a court or magistrate, it was found on appeal that such action was unlawful. And the Supreme Court of Illinois held, quote, We are of opinion the arrest of the plaintiff was illegal and the verdict contrary to the law and the evidence. And if the arrest was legal, they did not proceed according to law and take him before a magistrate for examination, but conveyed him to another county and there imprisoned him in the county jail in a filthy cell, thus invading one of the dearest and most sacred rights of the citizen, secured to him by the great charter of our land. Close quote. The requirement of bringing an arrested person directly to a court or judge is due process of law. And as such, this procedure cannot be abrogated by statute. Uh, the next section here is, uh, he titles it, As a Trespasser Ab Initio. And I think Ab Initio means from the beginning. Is that correct for you law lovers out there? Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Maria. All right, to can you continue on. It is a familiar rule of law that one who abuses an authority given him by law becomes a trespasser ab initio. That is, he becomes a wrongdoer from the beginning of his actions. 
Where one fails to take a prisoner he is arrested to a proper judge, or where he causes an unreasonable delay in doing so, the officer becomes a trespasser ab initio. The unlawful confinement by an officer makes the entire transaction, including the arrest, unlawful and a trespass. Thus, even in cases where an executive officer had made a lawful arrest, if he fails to bring the arrested person to a magistrate, he becomes a trespasser ab initio and liable. Court case, quote, an officer who has lawfully arrested a prisoner may be guilty of false imprisonment if he holds him for an unreasonable length of time without presenting him for hearing or procuring a proper warrant for his detention, close quote. The New York Supreme Court of Appeals stated the correct exposition of the law in a case where it is said that even though the arrest when made was legal and justified, the officers became trespassers ab initio and so continued to the time of plaintiff's release because of their failure to take him before a magistrate as required. And the Court of Claims of New York, in a case where the officers delayed in the claimant's arraignment, held that if there was an unnecessary delay in arraignment, the claimant before a justice of the peace, then the arrest itself became, became unlawful on the theory that defendants were trespassers ab initio, and so continued down to the time when the plaintiff was lawfully held under a warrant of commitment, regardless of whether or not the plaintiff was guilty of any crime. In Pastor versus Reagan, Supra, it is said that the rule laid down in the Six Carpenters case that if a man abuses an authority given him by the law, he becomes a trespasser ab initio has never been questioned. Where one was arrested for being intoxicated and confined in a prison without judicial inquiry, it was held to be a wrongful imprisonment. On this matter, the Supreme Court of Washington stated, quote, nor is the po police officer authorized to confine a person indefinitely whom he lawfully arrested. It is his duty to take him before some court, having jurisdiction of the offense, and make a complaint against him. Any undue delay is unlawful and wrongful and renders the officer himself and all persons aiding and abetting therein wrongdoers from the beginning. Close quote. Thus, when one fails to perform part of his duty and impinges upon the rights of a citizen, he is said to be a trespasser from the beginning because his whole justification fails and he stands if he, as if he never had any authority at all to act. Good stuff. Next section. Detainment is not a decision of arresting officer. The basis of the well-established procedure and law of taking a person arrested directly to a judge or court is to avoid having the liberty of the citizen unjustly dealt with by extrajudicial acts of executive or officers. Uh, court case quote, We believe that the fundamental fairness to the accused requires that he should with reasonable promptness be taken before a magistrate in order to prevent the application of methods approaching what is commonly called the third degree. Fundamental fairness prohibits the secret inquisition in order to obtain evidence." Close quote. Other reasons for the purpose of this rule requiring that the arrested accused be taken before a magistrate as quickly as possible is to make certain that the person arrested is advised by a judicial officer of his constitutional rights. This is not a duty of the officer through the erroneous Miranda warning. The only reason such warnings are being used is because police are not doing their duty and bringing the person arrested to a judicial officer, but instead are unlawfully taking them to a jail to have them booked. The detainment of a person after he is arrested is a judicial question. A judicial officer must decide if there are grounds for holding the person arrested, or whether he must be further examined by trial, or if he is to be bailed and released. To allow the executive department such powers of decision-making is the epitome of despotism. In a suit for false imprisonment, where several officers arrested the plaintiff on grounds he committed a felony, the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts held that the officers had no right to decide to detain the plaintiff to enable them to make a further investigation of the charge against him. The court declared that, quote, 
By having so arrested him, it was their, the officer's, duty to take him before a magistrate who could determine whether or not there was ground to hold him. It was not for the arresting officers to settle that question. The arresting officer is in no sense his guardian and can justify the arrest only by bringing the prisoner before the proper court, that either the prisoner may be liberated or that further proceedings may be instituted against him. Close quote. In a case where one was accused by another of stealing a watch and subsequently arrested and put in jail for one hour and then released, the sheriff was found guilty of false imprisonment as he failed to take the person arrested before a magistrate. The Supreme Court of Indiana upheld the convic conviction stating that, quote, the power of detaining a person arrested or restraining him of his liberty is not a matter within the discretion of the officer making the arrest, close quote. The court further stated that the sheriff cannot legally hold the person arrested in custody for a longer period of time than is reasonably necessary under all the circumstances of the case without possessing a proper warrant or taking him before a magistrate. If he does it, if he does, it is false imprisonment. Thus, where a sheriff had arrested two prisoners and detained them for five hours without making any effort to take them before a magistrate, he was guilty of false imprisonment. In this case, the Supreme Court of Idaho said, quote, the rule seems to be that an officer arresting a person on criminal process who omits to perform a duty required by law, such as taking the prisoner before a court, becomes liable for false imprisonment. Close quote. The law never allows an officer at his discretion to imprison the person arrested or detain him in a jail after arrest. This is a court case quote. We have no doubt that the exercise of the power of detention does not rest wholly with the officer making the arrest and that he should, within a reasonable time, take the prisoner before a circuit, criminal, or other judicial court. In a case where the arrest is made under a warrant, the officer must take the prisoner without any unnecessary delay before the magistrate issuing it in order that the party may have a speedy examination if he desires it. And in the case of an arrest without warrant, the duty is equally plain and for the same reason to take the arrested party before some officer who can take such proof as may be afforded, close quote. Executive officers or cl clerks are not to determine if a person arrested is to be held or released upon bail or fix the amount of bail since the power to do so is judicial. In a case where a person was lawfully arrested for driving in an automobile while intoxicated, the arresting officer delivered him to the jailer at 4.30 p.m. with the instruction that he be held there until 9 o'clock p.m., at which time he was to be brought before the judicial officer. The Supreme Court of Appeals of Virginia condemned this act, asserting that the officer usurped the functions of a judicial officer. Quote, but the actions of the arresting officer and the jailer in denying the defendant this opportunity to judicial review by confining him in jail because they concluded that he was not in such a condition to be admitted to bail had the effect of substituting their discretion in the matter for that of the judicial officer. Under the circumstances here, the defendant was clearly entitled to the benefit of a judicial opinion and judgment upon the question of his eligibility for bail. This right was arbitrarily denied him. Close quote. Executive officers cannot hold a person in order to complete paperwork or make out reports. Thus, where a man was arrested without warrant and confined in the county jail without a commitment, the sheriff could not justify the confinement of the man by awaiting the pleasure of a deputy or anyone else to file a complaint. The power of the executive officer over a person's liberty ends with the lawful arrest and he never has a discretionary power to detain the person without judicial authority. Court case, quote, if the plaintiff was being detained for the purpose of arrest, it was the duty of the arresting officer to take him before an examining magistrate as soon as the nature of the circumstances would reasonably permit. The power to arrest does not confer upon the arresting officer the power to detain a prisoner for other purposes. Close quote. Close quote. Arresting and releasing without bringing before a judge. 
While most of the emphasis on this type of false imprisonment deals with the delay in presenting a prisoner to a judge, the real duty and requirement is the actual bringing, carrying, or presenting the prisoner before a judge. Thus, a complete failure to do this is obviously unlawful, and this most often occurs when the officer releases the person he arrested without judicial presentment. An officer who arrests an indiv individual does not have the authority to place such a person in jail or other holding place and then later release him, as was revealed in the case of Harness v. Steele, where the sheriff placed the person arrested in jail for an hour and they released him without bringing him before justice of the peace, he was thus guilty of false imprisonment. It has become a common practice for arrested persons to be taken to a jail or police station to be booked, fingerprinted, photographed, measured, questioned, imprisoned, and then released after paperwork is completed. This wicked and oppressive procedure is so far removed from what due process of law requires it is shocking that such measures could be widely accepted as quote-unquote legal. The process of imprisonment and release at the discretion of the executive officer was condemned by the Supreme Court of Illinois in stating, quote, when officers assume the power to imprison without authority of law or without any form or processes usual and necessary to be employed, they become liable for false imprisonment. Close quote. The liberty of the uh, I'm sorry. It continues on. The liberty of the citizen cannot be so far trifled with that any constable in the land may, of his own volition, commit and hold him in custody until it suits his convenience or pleasure to release him. Close quote. When a constable or sheriff decides to release the prisoner arrested without taking him before a magistrate, he assumes judicial powers upon himself and is liable. Thus, where a town constable arrested a person who was intoxicated and imprisoned him in lockup until he became sober and then released him without taking him before a magistrate, he acted unlawfully and is liable. In this case, the Supreme Court of North Carolina stated, quote, Men may not be arrested, imprisoned, and released upon judgment or at the discretion of a constable or anyone else. If the alleged offense be criminal in its character, the officer may arrest and take the offender before a magistrate for trial. The constable arrested and imprisoned him, not for safekeeping until he could be tried before a competent tribunal, but he imprisoned him until he became sober, according to his judgment, and then released him. The constable thus constituted himself the judge, jury, and executioner. This is the best description of despotism. Close quote. When an officer institutes an arrest, he now has undertaken the duty to bring the arrested party to a magistrate. The person can only be released by judicial, not executive authority. Quote, the duty of the one making an arrest to bring the prisoner before a proper magistrate, that proceedings for the trial of the prisoner may be instituted, that may he, he may have opportunity to give bail or otherwise procure his release is even more imperative than if a warrant had been issued before arrest. And if the prisoner is released without being brought before such magistrate, the officer or private person who made the arrest becomes a trespasser ab initio. Close quote. Arresting a person is a step in prosecution. And if he is released not according to law, it is an escape. Such an escape is a departure of a prisoner from custody before he is discharged by due process of law. If a person is arrested pursuant to a warrant, he must be taken to a magistrate before he can be released. I guess this is in first Wharton criminal procedure. In deciding if a chief of police acted properly when he put two individuals he arrested in jail overnight and releasing them on their depositing bail, the Federal Court of Appeals said the actions of the officer in this case were arbitrary and unjust. The police chief had no right to determine bail and then release the prisoners without a hearing before a judge. The court said, in an able opinion, Judge Connor said the imprisonment in jail of a citizen without warrant, without opportunity for a hearing, or to give bail is a serious matter. The duty in every case is imperative upon the officer to 
forthwith or immediately carry the person arrested before the nearest judicial officer having jurisdiction to hear and determine the legality of such arrest. The general rule is stated as follows. One making an arrest may be liable in an act for false imprisonment where he fails to take the person arrested before the officer designated in the warrant or if the arrest is made without warrant to the nearest committing magistrate. If a prisoner accepts his release or is released at his request or with his consent, he does not waive his right of action. To say he has no right to sue under such conditions is allowing a situation that is susceptible of working great injustice where a person is unlawfully detained, he has a right of action irrespective of his release. Defenses. Just as good faith does not excuse an unauthorized arrest, likewise it does not justify an unreasonable detention and deprivation of one's liberty caused by failure or delay in bringing one arrested before a magistrate. It has been a common practice for officers to drop off persons they have arrested at a police station or county jail and leave the prisoner in the custody of others. This is a very dangerous and irresponsible act for an officer to follow. In doing so, the arresting officer relinquishes his duty and at his risk relies on others to lawfully deal with the arrested party. No officer can claim exemption from liability when he relies on others to take the arrested person before a judge without delay. He is responsible for the arrested person and cannot rely on others to perform his duty. Court case, quote, Orders from a superior do not ex excuse the arresting party from his duty to bring the prisoner before a judge, nor does delivery of the prisoner into the custody of another person. All those who take part in so detaining a person an unreasonable length of time are liable. Close quote. The Supreme Court of Ohio had stated a similar rule. Quote, the delivery of the plaintiff after his arrest into custody of another person to be by him taken to prison could not, we think, absolve the arresting officers from the duty required of them to obtain the writ necessary to legalize his further imprisonment. If the arresting officers choose to rely on some other person to perform that required duty, they take upon themselves the risk of its being performed. And unless it is done in proper time, their liability to the person in prison is in no wise lessened or effective. Close quote. One of the most common defenses raised in suits of false imprisonment of this nature involve arguments of whether the delay in bringing one to a court was reasonable or necessary. In Virginia, it was said that in determining whether an arrested person has been brought before a magistrate with all practicable speed or without unnecessary delay depends on the circumstances of the particular case. Ordinarily, this is a question for the jury unless the facts are disputed. The common law principle is that an officer was to present the person arrested without delay to a magistrate. This means no delay of time is allowed which is not incident to the act of bringing the accused to a magistrate. The cause of this breach of duty arises from the officer's total failure to act or failure to act timely. If he does not act diligently, he may not act timely. A reasonable time is not when the officer has free time, but means promptly, immediately, and without delay as soon as the circumstances permit. It was stated in an earlier case in New York that, quote, it was the duty of the officer making the arrest to convey the prisoner immediately before the nearest magistrate, and, close quote. In determining whether or not an officer's failure to take an arrested man before a magistrate immediately after his arrest was an unnecessary delay, the Supreme Court of Texas stated, quote, the accused has the right to be presented without delay. But the question of what is delay must be determined by all the facts and circumstances. Necessarily, some time must elapse between the arrest and the presentment before the magistrate. Close quote. It has been the practice of legislatures and courts to establish set times of 24, 36, or 48 hours for the delay allowed from the time of arrest until presented to a magistrate. Such measures are blatant acts of tyranny. As anyone can see that if such power exists to allow a delay of 24 hours, then the power also exists to delay 72 hours or 168 hours. The common law rule nullifies the exercise of such arbitrary power. That concludes Chapter 7 of our reading of False Arrest and False Imprisonment, Treatise by Charles A. Weissman. 
So I figure we'll just stop here and we could have some conversation about that if you guys want to. We'll just pick up Chapter 8 next week, if that's okay with you, unless you want me to continue reading on. I think we can stop here, if it's okay. good with everybody else. Oh, wrong thing. Sorry, I'm just talking out loud here. I've got to put down some notes. <clears throat> Okay, what do we all think? Pretty straightforward. I mean, this whole treatise is straightforward. Uh, like I said before, there's just a lot of great information with cases and stuff like that. The only um, thing I would be concerned with is um, just checking on these court case quotes because I'm, I'm a little leery when I read something. Um, that the quote is accurate because I've come across what seem like court case quotes out there in virtual land which I tried finding the source and couldn't find it so um, that would be my only concern about a lot of these these cases that um, he mentions Other than that, it's pretty solid. I mean, it's really amazing the uh, how how much they violate the law, starting at the the, the first second to the last second. And it's pretty incredible. Yeah. yeah, like, well, the one thing I noticed tonight was it's a judicial officer's decision if bail is going to be posted or if the detention is going to be continued and on the arrest warrant and we've been talking about Chris because it's been going on with him we're, we're aware of his situation but um, the arrest warrant had the amount of bail already set before the any hearing so he never had any hearing he was taken he was arrested and taken directly to jail without a warrant, without being taken to a magistrate on a, on a misdemeanor. Um, <clears throat> and kept there for nine days, but the bill was set at a thousand dollars before, you know, before he was ever arrested. So it. It's all backwards. It's all inside out and backwards. It's supposed to be that you get a hearing. Due process means you get to have a hearing before your life, liberty, or property is 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 arrested. You know, the hearing is the is supposed to happen before your liberty is is taken away. Right. Well, but I mean, they without, kind of, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, without this information, how can anybody even execute that? Like in your case, you, you demanded that you were to be taken before a magistrate immediately. Right. But they ignored that, right? They said that that was police department policy. And so... Um, I think that's something that we have got to change in Alaska. Um, there must be a statute in the state um, that follows along with what he was saying at the end. Some states have made it statutorily fine um, to wait 24 or 48 or 72 hours, and that seems to be the case up here because um, the, they have an arraignment something called an arraignment. And I guess that's what they use as an excuse to be saying that you're taken before a magistrate. Um, yeah, you're never taken directly to a magistrate here as department, police department policy. 
what was the result of your your oh you bailed out didn't you? Yes. And who set the bell? Do you, do you remember? Um. Hmm. It's funny because uh, the night the night I got there. Um, they, I was guilty of one charge and the bail was going to be $500. And they had all gone, they had already gone through everything of mine in my car, including my wallet, and they were counting my money. And they said, you have enough money to bail out tonight. Wow. And I said, that's not my money. And he said, well, whose money is that? And I said, that's God's money. And then in the morning, it was $1,000. Huh. Yeah, there was another charge. And they had also run my name through a sovereign citizen's database. And that's included in the police report. There's some kind of a blacklist against people who believe in God or believe in the law or believe in common law or... But freedom. Ran it through. Yeah, freedom. Sovereign citizens database. And so, yeah, it's just all kinds of crazy stuff. And then uh, there was one other thing about it. Oh, I demanded probable cause. What's the probable cause? You know, and they said, uh, you're, you got, there's a sticker missing on your license plate. And I said, that's not probable cause. Oh. They said, a probable cause is a crime. Yeah. A crime. You know, and and they, yeah, yeah, and I didn't even, at that time, I had only studied Eddie Craig. I had never seen this yeah. treatise before and just knew to ask what the probable cause was. Yeah. So. And now we know that, um, according to what we're learning, that probable cause isn't what a, anything a police officer could conjure up according to their statutes or something according to the code has to be felony related. Yeah. Has to be a felony and So how long were you in there for? Just overnight. Um, eight, eight from eight hours? Twelve hours? Um you know, I've never added up the hours, but it was about nine at night, nine or two, nine at night, nine thirty, ten at night until one o'clock. Well, no, it was like three or four the next afternoon. So it was almost 24 hours, I guess. Well, no, not almost 24. Anyway, it was a good amount of time, probably 12 hours, yeah. I wonder if you still, if you still have a case that you can go after these people. I do. I do. I don't think you can ever. We heard of something this week that's amazing, too, and I definitely have a case on this, where they pulled me out of the car pushed Katie out, said, you've got to get out of here, you know, you know, it's February 19th in uh, Fairbanks, and it's cold out, and they made her get out of the car and go somewhere, you know, uh, can we, can we, can we arrange a ride for you, and Bill was there sitting in a parking lot, because he was driving by another, he was, he had his truck, and we had a car, so anyway, um, they went through everything in the car. Yeah. They searched through everything. And what I learned this week was that every search is reviewable by the Supreme Court. Every search of an American is reviewable by the, by the Supreme Court of the United States. What it has to what it has to be reviewed by them. So what I guess an well, affidavit has to be brought before them justifying their search you, or Yeah, if you're if you are no, if you push it. If your any part of you or your property is searched, it's reviewable by the Supreme Court of the United States. So that's really interesting. And that came from oh George Gordon. I'm going through all of his stuff. Oh, huh. yeah. Well, what it was a it was a Supreme Court case cite. Citation? Um, he probably did. He probably did. I can't cite it for you right now, but I was. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow, there's I a could, lot of stuff I, out there. I, yeah, I could go back through. I mean, it's amazing what how much um, 
you know, it's obvious. It's amazing how much the common law does um, and how well protected we are by it. And it's obvious why the, uh, the, the uh, what do we call them, the, the rats have done everything they can to make us ignorant of this stuff. Yeah, and they obfuscated so by by passing by uh, conjuring up statutes. Their their charms, their magical charms. Yep, yep. And and you know who's doing this? Nobody's doing this. Nobody's taking these things into federal court. Yeah. Well, Maria, you know? you, you're going to start. You're right. <laughs> and yeah, I know I, I know I have a claim still on this. I mean, from like you said, from the beginning to the end, it's. It's illegal. It's unlawful. It's it's just wrong, what they do. So. It's, ama- it's amazing how there's more and more things that are coming to light for us that are learning this stuff. It, it seems it covers like every angle, like what you just brought up with the Supreme Court case, that you know every search has to be uh, reviewed. I mean that just covers yeah. their. That's just more uh, ammunition on our side. That you know, just supposed to protect our liberties and hopefully keep everything in check. Yeah, well, and and not every not every search is reviewed. It's reviewable, and what George Gordon says is you need to get your objections on the record so that it's it's reversible error. Which. It, it's almost like they're testing us, and 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 they're seeing nobody knows they're right, and they just go further and further, and we get dumber and dumber. Well, you know, we've and we, we've, we've spoke about. Uh, I believe it's a spiritual condition. Like any time I hear about this, uh, my mind goes to the Book of Judges. Mm-hmm. Have you read through the Book of Judges yet? No. Uh-uh. We're going straight through the whole Bible right now, but I haven't I haven't read straight through it. No. Oh, it's a great book. Uh, just to try to give you a summation of it, it's a period of time that the Israelites were sort of going through this this up and down relationship with uh you know with the Lord, and you know there'd be a, a period of time where they would be faithful to Him and they would trust Him, and then they would. And then a period of time came where they fell away. So the Eternal would raise up the heathen nations around them to oppress them. And you see time after time this up and down of... And, and, and Judges is, is sort of prophetic of you know, a future Savior and Deliverer. Because at the, in the book of Judges, the Eternal would raise up you know, uh, Saviors or Deliverers. Like, you know, the story of Gideon. I'm sure you, you have some idea of the story of Gideon and Samson. Um, sure. Mm-hmm. They, they, were ty- they, were type- they were types of Jesuses. And, um, but I see, like, the way the world is now is because, if we even take our country, is we're being oppressed by a foreign legal power because of unfaithfulness and not trusting our Creator. So he allows these entities to to rise up because it's a reflection of the spiritual condition of the people. Of the, and that's not to say that there's you know there's some people within that that have faith and they'll be protected. But on a whole, you know, we're not the United States. The United States is in deep spiritual darkness, and that's what I see. Because just think idealistically, if 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 God's people understood these lawful issues, um, it, it probably, this country would not be in the condition that it is. Because, you know, they reject the author of law, so if they're going to reject him, they have to be under some sort of law, so they're going to be under the adversary's law, which is oppression. So, in a sense, Satan has a legal authority over people who refuse to do what the Creator says. He refuses to trust. So that's what I think why we see in our time how this is blossoming so much. The, that level of evil, that level of un- iniquity, which is unlawfulness, is mm-hmm. 
is paramount in the land. It's because of the spiritual, I believe, because of the spiritual, spiritual condition of the people, especially God's uh-huh. people. Because yep. the word says judgment starts in the house of God. You know, how much worse is it going to be for the unrepentant sinner? So, you know, his own people aren't even using the law correctly. And so, okay, you want these people to rule over you? You think that these people are your leaders? You don't know how many times I've heard, you know, you know, in the, in the, um, the nonprofit organizations, we need to obey our leaders. Or, you know, we need to vote for our leaders. Nowhere, that's nowhere in Scripture. And, I mean, that could be a lesson in itself. And to think that an unregenerate has rule over you, I don't know what Bible you're reading, or you're just missing what the, you know, what, what, what the basic gospel message is. Now, I could see where someone's ignorant of that. That's okay. But, you know, there's been people like myself um, that have shared with other believers these, the issue of freedom, and it goes uh, rejected and neglected. So, you know, I'm not surprised. I'm, actually, I'm surprised that the condition is not worse. But anyway, I, I yield. <laughs> you got me fired up, Maria. <laughs> hey, good. Yeah, no, you're I, you're really on to something there, a lot there, and it's, you know, about putting yourself underneath unregenerate and causing, saying that that's because of our biblical interpretation of uh, Romans and yeah. That uh, yeah, that that God appoints the leaders, and we have to place ourselves under them. And you know, there's a lot I don't know, but that's well, yeah, just that's crazy. Yeah, but it's interesting <laughs> that leaders leaders is mentioned twice in the New Testament if you're using the authorized version, and it's used in a negative context. Mhm. It, it's very interesting. Okay. Yep. So if you're going to, you yeah. know, if, if you hear the mantra in the nonprofit organizations, leaders, 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 it's actually yeah. in, in the New Testament. And, and it was, one was quoted from Jesus where he said, uh, they're blind leaders of the blind. Leave them alone. Because when the <laughs> blind follow the blind, they both fall into a ditch. That's the context that leaders was used. You know, we see in, in Psalm 118 verses 8 and 9, it says, do not put your confidence in princes, but trust in the Lord. Or it's better to put your confidence in the Lord and put your trust in princes. Uh-huh. And then um, the other one is, well, let me see here. I want to get it right. Oh, Psalm 118. Uh, verse 8. It is better to trust in the eternal and to put confidence in man. Verse 9, it is better to trust in the eternal and put confidence in princes. And we know princes in that context was the uh, those who were in the positions of authority. Hmm, isn't that interesting? But yet the church today puts their confidence in princes. And they put their confidence in man. Whoops. It's a yep. big error. Yeah, and we're in that ditch that you, <laughs> the country's in that ditch that you mentioned, yeah. And, you know, it had to get to that condition before this takeover could happen. Right. So everybody out there belly aching about the the reset, the global reset and the one world order, you know. Um, well, you know the one world order, the, one new, the, the new world order is in place. It's, it's not. There's not a future. You know, they've already, they've already took control of the world. You know, they've already implemented their their order, which is their statutes and codes. I'm sorry, I cut you off. Oh yeah, well, you know, I'm just this 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 new. Um, where you look around you and you see the condition, the obvious condition of the people, and it's really obvious what condition they're in because they've got a mask on their face and they uh, they kowtow yeah. to every yeah. tin pot dictator that's on a podium. Um, 
talking about what they should should or should not do and you can see the condition i mean if we were if we were all studied up on our law and we were all strong bible believers that were in the word all the time there's no way that could have happened in this country and people were really kind of resting on their laurels and going on their name and you know and and not really taking responsibility and i i, I heard uh, matt matt bracken on somebody's show this last week talking about the bill bill of rights and he's hoping that everybody will learn the bill of rights and between the two the bill of rights and this treatise um you know it's it's the hour is late but those two things would be um really enlightening to uh first the church and then the others to start getting their getting their heads wrapped around what that really does mean yeah um well you know the good thing is we don't i we don't have to wait for that you know i've been always saying you know on an individual level if someone wants to do this in relation in their relationship with the creator they could benefit from it like i don't have to wait for you know four million people to do it because once we're given the knowledge we're also given the wisdom and we're also given the the confidence to live it out because it, it's really a living out that trust in the creator to carry it out like I, I don't live free independently of him I live free dependent on him I, I mean without him I mean obviously there's no freedom true freedom anyways so that's what you know what I've experienced that's what's so cool about this we don't have to wait for anybody to do it with us we could just do it with oh yeah no that's it's not a democracy I mean it's just like when you choose to follow Jesus it's a, a single you know it's your decision and you just make it singly yeah and he takes care of you on an individual basis uh-huh so, yeah, so I'm, Maria, you want to enjoy the freedom he gives? He's going to give you the power, and he's going to give you the the. He's going to allow you to enjoy that, even in all the people around you may be enslaved. Uh, yes, that, and, and that's one of the cool yeah. testimonies that we should have. Uh huh. Uh huh. And I, I would say, yeah. And we've been giving, we've been, we've been giving that testimony for quite a while, um, and and honestly believe it and it's true uh, but as far as this larger group of people that we're associated I mean they're they're in our space you know or they're at least occupying the same area that we are um, it's it's um, you know there's a lot of hope in this stuff if people just do simple things I mean, it's so hopeful and, oh. <clears throat> yeah, hope-filled, I guess I should say. So. You know, if the people would just would just trust the Lord, and that's because, I mean, it says it, you'll come across it in the Torah when, you know, the Lord just says, only if they would just trust in me. He could just turn it around in a second. But go to go to Judges chapter 8. This is interesting. Oh, I can't. I can't. Oh, well, maybe I can't. Here, let's see. And, and this this is the problem with, you know, God's people. Um, where is it? Is it 21? No. Oh, here it is, 22. So in Judges chapter 8, verses 22, this is after the Lord has given Gideon um, victory and has removed the oppression off of Israel. So it says, Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, You rule over us, both you and your son, and your son's son also, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. Whoops! They just missed it. So Gideon replies, and he said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Eternal 
shall rule over you. That is the issue right there. God's own people saying, well, who are we going to put in the White House to rule over us? Oh, we don't want him in the White House. Oh, we're going to have to put up with him in the White House. They missed it. Yeah. You know? Yep. On one, side, on one side of their mouth, they're saying, oh, yeah, the Lord rules over us. But on the other side of their mouth, they're saying unregenerate men we have to submit to. Yep. It doesn't make sense. Yep. Yeah. Hey, and I'm going to get off my soapbox here. That's okay. It's good stuff. <laughs> it's going to be a great recording. It's going to be up to you to... Uh, to get it out to the Upload. masses. <laughs> okay, uh, I I will do that sometime in the future. <laughs> I'm so far behind on stuff that I'm doing for people. Um, Be careful you don't get overwhelmed and and end up becoming useless rather than useful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. Well, it's been exciting. We're we're studying all kinds of interesting stuff. Um, 25 pages of the bond issues came through last week, and I got through all 25 along with the uh, the YouTube on that. So, and then George Gordon stuff, and this treatise, and a bunch of Crow Triple Seven stuff. I'm just trying to go back. Oh, going back through Richard Cornforth. Okay. Uh, I can't. I can't afford to go back through Carl Lentz because it's just too too many hours. But yeah. I, do that too, but um, do you go to sleep amazing. like listening to these recordings? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Instead of music, you listen to all this law stuff. Can you can you uh, elaborate on the? You mentioned about you've read something on bonds. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Oh, I can send it to you. Dave sent it to me. Um, it's a. I'll send it. It's a Gene Keating. We were talking about it last week. What do they they talk about the issue of the illegality of how they um, do their bond procedure or something like that? Is that what it's about? Not not per not per se. It's more about the 1099 OID original oh, issue. Card, card creditor stuff. Yep, yep. And yeah. and what I'm hoping to do is just kind of pick up on how that relates to, and it, I didn't pick up on it. In, in 25 pages, there wasn't enough there. But uh, what, what it was is a YouTube, uh, somebody redid Gene Keating's seminar on this original issue discount thing. Um, and it, it does make sense. You know, it starts to make sense, but it doesn't tell you as much as you want to know about the bid bond, the performance bond, and the payment bond, and that's, I, I just can't seem to find that. Yeah, I was watching um, some probably, more video. I was watching some more video. I'm sorry, good. I was just going to say it's probably somewhere on Angela Stark's channel, but I haven't gone there in a long, long time. So. I was watching some videos from the guy to stop the pirates. Oh. And, a lot of his videos are repetitive and basically from what I'm understanding from his videos, if you have a social security card and the number, I guess, on the bottom right hand corner, it's written in letters uh, it's alphanumeric written in red ink and he said, mm -hmm. are you aware of that? Like the letter represents mm -hmm. one of the 12 districts of the Federal Reserve Bank. Yeah. And yep. then that, mm -hmm. the numbers are your account numbers, so you could use that as sort of a routing number to have your bills paid and or pay off debt or buy a house or something like that. And, and he mentioned the 1099 OID form, which you said is the original um, issued discount form? Yeah, yeah. And then and, the 1099A, yeah. uh, which is the acquisition form. And mm -hmm. you use those. Now I'm just thinking to myself, Okay, it seems like it makes sense, but I mean, has anybody really done this and and it worked? And I'm thinking to myself, oh, yeah. I have a the IRS put a notice of lien on me maybe like nine years ago, 
and I sent the social, the social security card that was issued to me. I sent it back like 10 years ago, 11 years ago. So mm -hmm. I, I'm thinking to myself, even if I wanted to do it, I mean, you, you're dealing with the IRS, you know, again, and I'm with my lien and not having that card. Well, what am I going to go to the Social Security Administration and get the card back? You know, so for me, it's kind of maybe a moot point, but. Well, yeah, and, and I, I think it's, I, um, we've always stayed away from commercial, the commercial realm. You know, we're trying to, but I'm, I'm interested in what's happening in the courtroom. Right. What is happening with those bonds and how how do you deal with that in regards to what's going on there lawfully? With the trust um, and, and with the with the trust paradigm and all that stuff as well because it seems like it's, right. it's connected. Yeah, I mean, I think um there's there's a guy who has Gemstone University and he like I I think we've talked about him before, but he talks about you being a bonded surety of a bankrupt entity. Yeah. And that seems to comport exactly with the stuff that happened in 1933, the Trading with the Enemies Act and the, the, the uh, Emergency Banking and Relief Act of 1933 and then of 1934. And it makes sense and even integrates with what Ron McDonald tells us in his book that this is, and and lots of people have gone through this stuff, you know, um, James Traficant talked about it in the congressional record that the corporation had been bankrupt. Uh, the guy KL talks about the history of the bankruptcies, and you see every 70 years yeah. from the founding of the country, these bankruptcies happen. So it, it absolutely makes sense that the human resources are being used to pay back that debt. Yeah, because there's no more there's no other collateral yep. available. So, so how do we get lawful remedy when the courts are private banks just trying to steal from our SDKV trust? What do we do? Right. You know, we're we're talking about law and common law and how things are supposed to be and they're thinking yeah, we're just gonna we're just gonna charge you. Yeah. We ju you know, just get out of my face so that we can charge you for these bonds. So how does how does that relate to what they fine you? What the fine is? Yeah, and, and you know, if and, you're getting the bonds, why are you getting a fine? Yeah. Or like, what actually? What are the actual steps that they take to when they do all of their administration? Like, if they're going to tap into the account, or if, like for example. I've heard that the birth certificate is a bond and it's put on the market and it's and it's sold. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, so a guy in Saudi Arabia is going to buy a birth certificate with my name on it and he pays 10 grand for it. So who who gets the $10,000? And why would he buy why would he be purchasing something of a birth certificate for $10,000? So what? Now he's going to send it sell it to somebody in Russia. Fifty thousand dollars. I mean, you know what I mean? Because that's basically well, that's what happens when well, stuff's on the market, right? People exchange well, the paper things. No, and not the bond market. The bond market has to do with all these bonded sureties, and they're they're um, what's it called when they're all put together and they create they create a mortgage backed security and people bet on those. It's a betting game. You're betting. You know, kind of like on the stock market, you're betting, but you're just betting on the bond market. Yeah, but, you know? but for for what though? I mean, okay, they so they buy a pool of birth certificates. I mean, who's buying the pool of birth certificates? If for what reason? And then who gets well, that money? Yeah. That's what yeah, I want to know. You know? Yeah, yeah, I know. The behind the scenes stuff so, that goes on. Yeah. It doesn't make it doesn't make a terrible amount of sense, but yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean when I say that? Because you hear these guys say these things, but they never bring it to the next level to actually reveal what's going on behind the scenes. Exactly. Yeah. Like Joe exactly. Blow has just bought you know 
500 birth certificates at a certain amount of money. Okay, what's he going to do with them? And then who gets the money from his purchase? Well, I'm just thinking out loud. Because that's basically what it sounds like to me when these guys talk about all these birth certificates being put up. Obviously, some, and they're worth a lot of money. To who? Who yeah, thinks the birth need, certificate's a lot greater, of money? We need the greater context, and you'd be an idiot to go start. I think you're, you're an, you'd be an idiot to go start um, trading on these things that you hear until you get the big picture and you understand right. Right. exactly how this fits. Yeah. And I, you know, obviously it's, it's, uh, doesn't appear to be the information's not in the public purview. It's, it's somewhere, it's somewhere in the IRS code or I guess in the IRS code or in the federal code, if you can interpret it. But it's, you know, it's, it takes a real strange person to be able to interpret the federal code. I mean, just re go through this, this 1099 OID stuff. The way he gets to his conclusions is like, whoa, you know, you, you can't see it there. Yeah. You can't see where he came up with this exactly. Um, another, uh, we read about, or I read about on a, somebody else's website. Um, I think it's called Four Winds, and it's talking about don't follow this guy Gene Keating because these people went through part of his process and and took advantage of an IRS uh, gift or what's it called tax credit. There's a 390, $397,800 tax credit you can take advantage of every year. You can get the credit. And they, they, they did this process, whatever it was, and there was that amount of money was put into their bank account, and then they started paying off everybody they knew with this, these credits. And before you knew it, the IRS was after them. And just to test and see, you know, let's see what they do. And they didn't know what they were doing, and they panicked. And now they say they're in trouble, you know, because they they did a part of a process where they didn't understand the full picture. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of that out there. Um, you know, you, you, you have to be able to operate 180 degrees from what your beliefs are, though. You have to be able to see things in a mirror and then try to operate while looking in a mirror. And it's backwards. And I don't think very many people have the capacity to do that. Yeah, I don't, I really, at this point, I don't see any need for that use that process yeah. in daily life. Yeah. Yep. It's, I mean, it's commercial, so it's backwards to yeah. us. Um, and, it's all um, about the money. Yeah, for them it is. For them it is. Not for us. So we got sort of off the topic here. <laughs> As usual. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm curious. You may not even have an answer because um, I asked I asked you this earlier about you pursuing um, now with your this new information that you've learned uh, that you're going to pursue these people for falsely arresting you and imprisoning you and all that fun stuff. I mean, you really you really praying about following through with that. Yeah, I'm learning as much as I can and kind of watching what other people are doing. And um, if it becomes obvious that that's what I need to do, and maybe that's how I pray about things and get prompting, you know, okay, now's the time. Look at this. Is it like, you know, the Red Seas have parted. Go do this. Yeah. But that's not, not apparent. Not apparent. Not now. Right. I need to, I need to know so much more, and I need to be able to 
confirm everything that we've learned, get a confirmation that it's right. And I want to be able to do this, uh, you know, with muscle memory, without having to look. Yeah. You know? But uh, also, it's common law. It's biblical. We need to be able to use the New Testament, well, and the Old Testament. That's where I want to quote from. That's our law. You know, so we need to understand, I need to understand the principles, where they came from, how they apply. Um, But there's, you know, there is the complication of the federal courts being, you know, they do take, um, there's two categories. You can ask any question. You want a federal determination of any question. And so if you're involved in something, you know, you want to figure out what the federal questions are. Or you have a claim and you take, you know, you go in with a civil rights claim or complaint. And they tell you right on the form, I've seen it, don't talk about the law, don't talk about anything. Just say what happened to you. Say what happened to you and put this in and we'll just, you know, we'll get back with you. So if you bring up any kind of status issues or jurisdictional issues or anything else, it's not going to go anywhere. It's purely for 14th Amendment U.S. citizens. What does that government in Washington, D.C. say about this? Unless, I guess, our court of original jurisdiction is the the Supreme Court of the United States, is what I'm understanding. So you take an Article III claim into the Supreme Court of the United States, maybe that's where the right, the original venue, the, the right venue is to start your claim against the... I heard, I heard a while ago that... Um... The Article Three courts in the District of the District of the United States and the statutory courts and the administrative court is the uh, United States District Court. I mean, do that word swapping. Have you ever heard of that? Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, and is that is that true? Time. The only way to tell is to test it to 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 stylize your paperwork that way because the paper you know the paper is the court so you invoke that court's jurisdiction by putting the heading the title at the top the district court of the United States and maybe reference article 3 and somehow mm-hmm. so but what we need is people who've had wins that way you know and I'm getting through. I'm getting through George Gordon's stuff, so he may, there may be stuff in this audio file where he tells you exactly what to do. Well, that's cool. He, he, you know, he's like this is like 40 years old, and wrong even that. 40. No, no, but even 40 years ago, he was saying, you go into the state court and you're going to get run over. You need to take this into the federal court. You need to get your record done in the state court, in the in your local court, and then take it in and and find out what the re, the uh, reversible error and the federal questions are. Well, it seems so, like from know, this treatise that I mean, there's a lot of references to the state supreme supreme courts of the individual states where people have um, had positive results. So obviously they're in the book, they're in a treatise. So, um, yeah, I hear yeah. that often. But yet we read court cases where people have won in court, not, and it's not necessarily on you know in a federal jurisdiction. Yeah. Well, I think that has to do with where the you know if it's you making the claim, and where the um, where you start your claim. 
you know, you want to start your claim in the superior court of your state. And that's the court of record. And then the only appeals court in the state is the Supreme Court. So you can't go so, directly to the Supreme Court? Or can you? It's a question. That's a question. I, I don't know the answer to that, but I know you can start a claim in your in your superior court in your state, and then the court of appeals for that is the Supreme Court of your state. Hmm. But one of the people I've studied seems to think, I think, you know, there's so much I haven't studied. You know, the, the Judiciary Act. Well, there's a lot, one of, person, a lot of stuff out there. Well, that's pretty, yeah, that's pretty foundational, the Judiciary Act, 1792. Um, to see what the court of original jurisdiction is, I know if, you know, if you look at the, if you look at the Constitution, it talks about certain things. If the minister of a state is involved, um, let me see, beginning of Article 3. Um, in all cases affecting ambassadors or other public ministers and consuls, and those in which a state shall be party, Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. That's the one that they were relying on when they went into the Article 3 Court of Original Jurisdiction. That's where Texas took its case. Um, but all cases affecting public ministers, doesn't that sound like when you've been messed up over by one of the public servants? The Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. So that's Article 3, Section 2, Clause 2. Yeah, that would probably be the, the next thing to investigate. Exactly where do you file this paperwork? Yeah. Yeah. We've been focused, very much focused on how to defend ourselves. So yeah. going on the offense, you're right, it's a whole different animal. Different tactics. Dave, you, uh, you want to weigh in on anything that we've been discussing here? Well, just listening. I don't believe in entering anything into the court. Because when you do, you're in their jurisdiction. If I do anything against the powers that be, I will do it, have done it with a commercial affidavit or an affidavit. Because under it's Twill versus the United States, or KISS, I get them mixed up on my affidavit. But all it takes is an affidavit to open a case. An affidavit is an indictment. An affidavit is prejudicial and non-judicial. An unrebutted affidavit stands as truth and judgment. To me, that's the answer. So, but where would you file that, though? I mean, what, what, what do you do with that? <laughs> you wronged me. I send you an affidavit just like it says what it takes to make a crime. First, someone has to break the law. Secondly, there must be an injured party because of that law was broken. The injured party states their claim and the restitution they demand, and you prove that the damage was caused with intent. And that's how you write your affidavit. You said how they wrong you, and they have to show that I didn't wrong you and I didn't have intent to do that. If they don't respond, then if you follow the process, it becomes judgment. So you're dealing like you would deal directly with 
for example, the policy enforcer that caused you harm? The person, the, yeah. Who else? You know, he's, right. he's the one who injured me. Why would I go to court? Now, that's If you go to court and you're suing him, you do the same thing. Why take your chances in court? Under the right, you're exhausting your, exa exa your administrative process too, rather than. And you must you must exhaust your administrative remedies before you go to court. Yeah. But the funny yeah. thing is, a court can't a court can't hear your affidavit because it's prejudicial and non-judicial. Judges can't get involved unless they're named in the affidavit. Attorneys can't get involved unless they're named in the affidavit. <sighs> Go on the internet to a thing called commercial lien, a powerful, pro a most powerful process or a powerful process by Alfred Addix, A-D-A-S-K. He passed away in 2014. He had a website called, uh, oh, what was it called? Yeah, yeah, I've heard of him. Anti Scheister? Yeah, anti yep, Scheister. Yep. Mm -hmm. He's got a whole bunch of things on there, but I followed my, the PS process and have worked it and been quite successful with it. You you were successful? I have, I have done it. Is that what you said? I haven't done it very many times. Yeah, I did it, did it in prison, and every time I sent one in, I got an incident report and got sent to a, to a higher prison. But I did get a warden. Moved. I, I went after some people that wrong did some stuff to me that they shouldn't have done. But the warden was his family's associated high up in the prison system. They immediately moved him to a different prison. When I was back not far from you at White Deer, Pennsylvania, I had a roommate that they beat him up and broke his hand when they arrested him, and they were sending him a hospital bill for fifteen thousand dollars, and he was threatening to sue them for injuring him in exchange for paying their $15,000. I said, why don't we write an affidavit? Well, what's that? Well, I wrote a three-page affidavit. And within 10 days, we had a letter back from the county attorney offering to settle the case for $137,000. Yeah, that's something... Uh, uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know whether he got it or not, but I did see the. I did see the, the paperwork. Before that, I did an administrative process on a uh, bogus traffic ticket to a small town that they were trying to just collect money, and I sent them a about a five-page thing like my mentor would have, would have written, <clears throat> and I never heard from them again. And that's I found, all I cared about. Just leave me alone. Yeah. Yeah. It's this. Uh, sounds like there's some merit in that. I came across a guy on on the internet. He's a private attorney general. He has a private administration process, which he calls a the, notar the notarial certificate of default. Notar okay. Notarial protest. So, for example, like what you're saying, you send. Uh, the wrongdoer, the trespasser, an affidavit, and they ignore it. Then you send them something else, and then they ignore it. And then, then you have a uh, certificate of default, and this is all going through a notary. Um, through, so it seems like a long way to through a notary. You, you send your first one out, get through a notary. You send it out with your claim on it and give them 7 to 30 days to respond. When they don't respond in that time, then you write a second, which is notice of fault and right to care. And just says, hey, dummy, you didn't answer my affidavit on such and such a date. You may have a good reason. You may have no reason. But I'm going to give you another 7, 20, 30 days, whatever you want, to respond. If not, then by acquiescence, you agree to the charges and the case will close by acquiescence and your silence. Then when he doesn't respond again, then you send out your final notice, which is notice of default and consent to judgment. And that just says, hey, 
I gave you a chance, two chances to respond. You didn't respond, so by your acquiescence, stairs to CC and operation of law, you agree that the facts are true and you consent to judgment. Then you put all those together and under Rule 55 to, to have a, a judgment, an affidavit to submit it into judgment, you take it to the, if it's against an individual, you take it to any clerk in any court and you have them stamp a copy for their records and most importantly you get a, a copy for your records, maybe a couple of them. There you have your court-ordered judgment. And it's enforceable however you want to enforce it. You have a, have a sheriff have a sale next week. You can garnish your wages. You can garnish your bank account. Put a lien on all their property. Turn them into the Better Business Bureau and their credit cards go become frozen or what have you. Because you're probably talking about a pretty good sum of money, you know, like two or three million dollars. Well, Maria, that sounds like the way to go. You still there, Maria? Yeah. Yeah, it does. I was looking for Alfred Aid Asks um, uh, process again. I I can't find it on my in my files. If you want, I, I have it. I have Google it's on the internet. Oh, okay, you have it already, Peter. You okay, have yeah, the, I have. Uh, I have the process from the uh, from the private attorney general. I've got. I could send you a zip file on that. It's a bunch of uh, PDFs. I'll send that to you. You can check that out with the material certificate of uh, default. <clears throat> okay, and would you send me the um, the uh, treatise, the sheriff's treatise too? Yeah, absolutely. I don't think I have that. I, my filing system is horrid. <laughs> you got to update. <laughs> you got to upgrade, yeah. upgrade and update. Unfortunately, if, if you're going to yeah. use that notary thing, uh, Peter, most notaries don't know how to do it. They only, they only certify signatures. That's what they're told. That that's all they're allowed to do. Which, which isn't so if you read the 1906. Pope's book of, of notary, it tells what all the powers. Notary has the same judicial standing as a justice of the peace or, or a town magistrate or something like that. I'm sorry, what was the, pub the publication again? You said it was uh, the law and notaries? P-B-R-O-B-S-T on notaries. P-B... R O B S T, I think it is. I can't pronounce it. But it's 1906. I'm looking for my copy of it. I haven't found it yet, but I'll find it one of these days. They changed the notarial handbook in 1963, I believe. They did away with that one and changed it so that the notary has their outline of stuff they can do doesn't include that. So 1906 includes a material protest. Yeah, I'm not saying but anything online. You probably won't find it online. They probably kicked it off and hid it away. Of course. But you know, it's, 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 it's called um, notary. There's if you could look up notary presentment, notary presentment yeah. process, something like that, that's what. Well, that's the, the secret to all of it is to send it through a notary when you, when you send it to them because that, if it ever does go to court, although it's not supposed to go to court because it, it says the only way it can be overturned is with a common law jury. That's the rules of the of the affidavit. Part of the, the maxims of law that go along with it. Here's something I just found on a SEDM website, Sovereign Education Defense 
Ministry. It says notary certificate uh -huh. of dishonor process. So I guess they go into and they're they're pretty they get into stuff in the nitty gritty. Yep. So I'll check that out. That might be a really good place. I should I should try to study what they have on bonds there because they probably have dissected it all. Didn't you get two two things? One on Jean King's seminar and didn't went there another attachment to the thing I sent you the night? I did that, yeah, and I and I did I went through the whole twenty five pages and the and the uh the YouTube well, the you know one. where you can hear. Yeah. And I and I've got the, the other, other one, one up talked right about now. the the twenty three, twenty four and twenty five bid bonds and the uh, one ninety one, one ninety two, one ninety three bonds. Yeah, it's, talked it's about just the bonds bonds go into the court. You you bond your case. Well, they're saying when they when you go to court, the, the lawyers take your checkbook because somebody has to bond every case that goes into court. Most of the time, it's it, and you have a right to see who the bond is since it's you, and you're the beneficiary of trust that the bond was issued out of. Therefore, you can plead guilty to the case and release the bonds, dismiss the case, and funds expunge the record. And if they don't want to, what is it? Uh, the words infrastructure, infrastructure or something like that, they're engaged in, in addition to hypothecation, which is not legal. I'm going to have to we go have, through that again. I didn't get all the way through that. Um, and maybe I didn't get down far enough. I just didn't see that I was finding finding what I was looking for. But maybe that that yeah the the other link well, is going to be better. Twenty three, twenty four, and twenty five. And there's another form that I've never been able to find called a thirty or thirty one, and that has oh. to do with the with the bankruptcy. Okay. It's been a long time since I, I studied and read that stuff because it takes a lot of paperwork, a lot of time understanding. And to me, the affidavit is just plain and simple. You get their oath of office and, and send them the affidavit, and they're in trouble. Yeah, it seems like you could get to where you wanted to go just with the affidavits, and it sounds like sounds like that might have been the piece we've been missing for quite a long time. If, you, if, if you're look, looking at a public servant, you get the oath of office and accept it, like the words I give, I've given out a lot of times. And you give them a copy, and you keep the copy, and, and uh, just like it says, now you and I have a private binding contract. When they violate that contract, you have a tort claim. You put it into an affidavit. They can't rebut it. Therefore, whatever damages they caused you, you take it to the court and get it stamped after the anywhere between 21 and 90 days, depending on how much time you give them to respond. You got your judgment. Yeah, it makes sense to me. See, I think, you know, they they can't disavow it because it, it, the judgment came out of a court. And you follow the administrative process. You, you're exhausted your administrative remedies, and then you turn it over to the court to get a judicial remedy. And then you follow the instructions because that's what it says to do in Civil Rules Procedure Number 55. You know, I think I looked that up and nothing came up. Or Let me see here. Federal, what did you look up? Federal Civil Rules Procedure, that section. 55? Yeah. Yeah. 
default default judgment when a party against whom a judgment for affirmative relief is sought has failed to plead or otherwise defend and that failure is shown by affidavit or otherwise the clerk must enter the party's default oh there you go okay maybe it's some other part of the so I'll read 56 or 50 yeah 56 what what is 56 read 56 that tells you just google federal rules procedure 56 summary judgment motion for summary judgment or partial summary judgment a party may move for summary judgment identifying each claim or defense or the part of each claim or defense on which summary judgment is sought the court shall grant summary judgment if the movement shows that there is no genuine dispute as to any material fact and the movement the movement is entitled to judgment as matter of law the, the court should state on the record the reasons for granting or denying the motion so it's time to file a motion procedures well, that's pretty cool thanks Dave they changed they changed it around then some because it used to deal with an affidavit it said an affidavit unrebutted affidavit stands as truth and judgment well that was in that was in rule 55 the one that you did give so that was correct well, that's that's how you that's how you enforce it Rule 50, 56 used to say that an unrebutted affidavit stands as truth in judgment, but they, they changed it around like they did Rule 17, the real party of interest. But, you know, you used to be able, if you understood Rule 13, 17, 55, and 56, you know, you could use those and, and get home pretty much freely. Well, actually, yeah, it does say that in, in Rule 56 and <clears throat> in paragraph I guess C under procedures it says uh, C4 affidavits or declarations an affidavit or declaration used to support or oppose a motion must be made on personal knowledge set out facts that would be is that what you're talking about yep yep that's in there and show the affiant or declarant is competent to testify in the matters stated uh, Maria it's interesting that they, they put in their declarations affidavits and declarations or declarations yeah and then it does doesn't go on to say they stand as truth and judge non rebutted affidavit stands as truth and judgment uh, it says if a non movement shows by affidavit or declaration that for specific reasons it cannot present facts essential to justify its opposition the court may oh when it, when facts are unavailable to the non movement non movement uh, it just says an affidavit or declaration used to support or oppose a motion must be made on personal knowledge and set out that would be admissible in evidence and show that the affiant or declarant to, is competent to testify in the matter stated. <clears throat> okay, well, but like I said, they they may have in the last short period of time we worked it. Because it, that's not how it used to word, be worded. They did they rework seventeen, I know. But if you can read through the legalese in seventeen, it still says there must be a real party of interest, and there must be. It used to say it'd be a ratification of commencement, but they changed that around to something that means the same thing but it doesn't sound the same and it's interesting nonetheless up, you need to look up ratification of commencement and see what that means did you say ratification of commission commencement ratification of commencement okay You may have to look up ratification and commencement separately. Okay, there's something on Freedom School. Ratification and commence, commencement and the real party and interest. Rule 17 of the Federal and State Rules of Civil Procedure. 
and then they got some stuff to, to take a look at. And you said rule thir uh, 13, didn't you? 13. If you have a claim against you, you must make a counterclaim or you waive that right. And then everyone needs to be familiar with Rule 1, Civil Procedure Rule 1. It's backed up by 27 CFR 7211. <laughs> it's just spewing these things out. <laughs> Federal rules. Yeah, to, to me, I've, I've tried to get it down as, as simple as you can. You know, you can spend a lot of time, you know, reading over cases and legalese and law books and, and yeah. this or that. Right. But 27 CFR 7211, all crimes are commercial. Therefore, they fall under the civil rules of procedure. Rape, murder, grand theft. Those are all civil crimes. Yeah, well, to go they through. all have to be. It all has to be commercial because it's all under the civil law. That's right. And they're just so they, collecting money. It's all about the money, so it's got to be commercial, well, right? It's all about yeah. the money. So they all follow FRPC, FRCP, is what you're saying, the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. Yeah. I, I believe so. Yeah. I, I think you're exactly right. Yep. They charge you criminally, but yeah. they try you based under civil, well, they try you under whatever rules they got. I, I, they don't follow their own rules, but you can point out the rules that they're breaking and hold their feet to the fire. You know, you can beat them with their rules if you go to court, but the affidavit can keep you out of court. And that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to settle it before you go to court, yeah. not waste the valuable court time. Yeah, that's you know, not False arrest the moment that guy turns on his lights and stops you, mm -hmm. he arrested you. And he can't give you a ticket because he's not following the rules. If he gives issues you a citation, you know, that's just an offer to contract. You can just say, thank you for the offer, but I refuse to contract at this time. you got 70, 72 hours to do that under Regulation C, Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Yep. Good stuff. Yeah, get check it back. Yeah. Yeah. Very good stuff.